Hello world, it's Birdo Prey 5 Kapla. Welcome to our review of Star Trek Picard, Season 3, Episode 6, The Bounty. Let's just get started. So, at the end of last week, we were really teased with these visions or premonitions or whatever it was that Jack Crusher was having. We were so close. We were seeing like this red door, this mysterious door, and these red or black vines growing everywhere, like on everybody or everything. And we were like, we were really going to find out. They were teasing that door. That door was so close to being opened. We were finally going to see what was behind that door. And then I watched this entire episode, 52 plus minutes. Not a single vision from Jack Crusher again this episode. Not a, he, Oh, he does plenty of stuff. Don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, this episode, I would say, has the most uh, TNG characters in it of any so far. And uh, we get Worf and Rafi coming on board. And, uh, I mean, obviously you're watching this. You don't care about spoilers. And uh, you've already seen the, the thumbnail, which uh, Terry Metalis himself had tweeted out uh, days and days ago. Uh, Jordy. Jordy comes in on this episode as well. And uh, there is a little bit of a worst-kept secret surprise. Uh, well, two cameos. Uh, one maybe more than a cameo at the end. But uh, this is also the episode where we get uh, Professor Moriarty, and I'm pretty sure that the uh, three or four minutes of screen time he has is all we're going to see of him. And we also get Data. Data is back, but he isn't. Uh, cockamamie. I can't believe how many times I've used the word cockamamie in uh, Picard reviews, but there is so much cockamamie in this episode. And the thing is, the thing is, if not for a few completely cockamamie, bullshit, ridiculous, out of left field stories, honestly, I think this might have been the best episode yet. Like it, it, it wasn't soul crushing. It, oh, don't get me wrong. There are some major, major issues I have. But on a whole, this is easily, I'd say, my favorite episode to date, perhaps minus the first episode where I was just full of of hope, even though I didn't I forgave it a lot because like, well, it is the first episode. Like you you, you have to in my book, you have to forgive because uh, you think, well, if they wrap these up in the next episode, not so bad. But of course, that wasn't the direction they started. Anyway, to start with episode six, uh, the episode opens up and we have a a beacon that says USS Titan on it. And it's it's glowing and it's beeping in space. And okay, it's making a sound in space, but truthfully, I can forgive that as all previous tracks probably would have had a beacon making an audible sound, just so we knew what it was. So they left a tracking beacon and almost immediately three different starships uh, warp in. Uh, I'm not really up on what, which ones. I think there might be an Akira. One looks like a Sovereign, which was like the Enterprise E, and uh, I don't know what this other one is, but three Federation starships uh, all, all warp in. Surrounding the buoy, you can tell they thought that was the Titan, but it wasn't. But it does give us three beautiful ships and this beacon beeping and glowing in space. And then we cut to the beacon or another beacon. And then instead of instead of three Federation starships, 
it's the uh, the Shrike. The Shrike, which was gone all of last episode. We didn't see we didn't see Vatic or the Shrike at all in episode five. Uh, the Shrike is back, and they're also at a beacon, and they're saying, uh, Vatic is saying, "Where are they?" She's 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 getting angry. She's she's saying, "The next ill-defined, unshapen one of you." Like she's she knows her crew is changelings, but she we're told is also a changeling. So it's kind of a weird threat to make. Uh, anyway, she says the next one of you that tells me they can't locate Picard is going to go uh uh uh. She's like she can't even say it. And then they're talking their stupid bird language, like click 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 click, and uh, in the subtitles. They're saying that the uh, the Titan is 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 laying down uh, buoys or uh, yeah decoy transponders, and they're jumping to warp at infrequent intervals. But well, they're jumping to warp at infrequent intervals. That's your excuse. Why would you say infrequent? I mean, you just lie to her. Just just lie, saying they're jumping to warp too fast. Because that's really what you mean. Regardless of how frequent they jump to warp, they're jumping to warp too fast for you to track them. So say they're jumping to warp too quickly to, to get a lock. Uh, don't say jumping at infrequent intervals. What, what does that even mean? And then, and then the guy has the gall to tell her, and I'm assuming it's a guy, the gall to tell Vatic that they're a step ahead of you, not a step ahead of us. They're a step ahead of you. Vatic, Vatic is reminding him, as are we, as are brothers and sisters who suffer each day, having to wear the faces of the Federation. So she is a changeling, I would guess. And she's looking at her cigarette, which is, or her cigar, whatever it is. Honestly, she sounds like she's a goddamn pirate. She's saying there'll be a day of lifeless bodies burning in space, and only then will there be silence and peace. Only then there'll be unity, peace again. So if she's a shapeshifter, she is bent on the destruction of all solids, and only once all solid life has been extinguished from the universe, then the shapeshifters can go back to being peaceful again. When there's, I, I, it doesn't even make sense. The Dominion, they have solids, they have Vorder, they have Jem Hadar, and they are in control of it. Okay, the Dominion, as we saw in the far superior Star Trek Deep Space Nine, was. A, a great villain because they were they were believable they were real they didn't want to destroy all organic life in in the galaxy they wanted to control all organic life in the galaxy and they had a pretty good job they had a pretty good leg up on doing it they created gem hadar soldiers that struck fear into the hearts uh, and minds of everybody who knew them. They had Vorta, who were master tacticians and, and representatives for what the changelings themselves wanted, but it freed the changelings from having to go do anything particularly dangerous. It was only the very, very big jobs when they wanted to impersonate a, a Federation uh, person that they would actually send a shapeshifter to do it. And Presumably, they only needed a few to cause havoc. Because if, you know, this, this doesn't make any sense. Why are they wasting changelings on, on becoming low-level Starfleet officers? When all you need to do is, you know, have a handful of changelings and you become the, the president of the Federation, you become the uh, highest up ranking members in Starfleet, and then you can do whatever you want to do for the most part. You don't need 
hundreds of changelings taking over hundreds of ships. You just need a few. And if nobody's even expecting them, what, 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 I, that's the difference. That's the difference between an excellent show like Deep Space Nine and this show, where even the, quote, villains, that they're one-dimensional, unbelievable villains because they, like, want to destroy. And, and this was season one. The big bad was a AI that lives across the dimensional barrier, and they wanted to destroy all organic life. And now we're back for season three, and now it's these renegade changelings that want to destroy all organic life. And it just, it makes no sense. So Vatic is going on about how we're going to have vengeance. Vengeance. So I understand, and they kind of bring this up later in the episode. These changelings are really pissed about the virus. Okay, the virus that Section 31 introduced to the changelings, and uh, it's apparently maybe not all the changelings got cured as quickly, as easily as we were led to believe when Odo got to the Great Link and we saw in Deep Space Nine the entire planet of changelings went from that nasty brown to that glowing silvery liquid. It seemed like it happened very quickly. But maybe, and I, I listen, for the sake, for the sake of storytelling, maybe you can say, listen, Section 31 introduced this virus, and we saw that that female shapeshifter was almost dead, almost dead by the time uh, Odo got to her. But at the time, it was it was revealed to us that the more you shapeshifted or the more you held physical form, the quicker the virus acted on you. And that was why, presumably, uh, the female shapeshifter had it so bad. But Odo, uh, Odo had it pretty bad, too. But the shapeshifting world, they didn't maybe have it as bad. So when Odo got there, you know, I thought, okay, he saved them all. But the reality is, maybe some of them did die or permanently injured. And this is why we have some breakaway shapeshifters. And if that's the case, I, I can believe it, but it is kind of a, a, um, a retcon from Deep Space Nine. Anyway, this ridiculous bird people changeling, which I don't know, there's no explanation as to why these changelings are like bird people, Jaffa from Stargate, uh, but whatever. He's telling us, but Frontier Day is 72 hours away, and they're no closer to finding Picard's son than before, and maybe it's time or a new plan, and Vatic has him vaporized. He has, she has him vaporized. So this business about no changeling harming another, apparently for these renegade group of changelings, that doesn't really matter. Uh, and now we got another big problem I have with this uh, episode. Vatic says, I want to know everything there is to know about Jean-Luc Picard. I want to know his entire family history. I want to know every friend and every family member he might go to. Now, way back in episode one or two, when we first meet Vatic, she knows everything there is to know, seemingly about everyone she talks to. She knew, she knew all about Captain Shaw. She knew all about Jean-Luc Picard. And like, okay, I could get, if you, if you were looking for Jack Crusher, which is what she was doing, 
you would already you would you would do your history and you would know about Captain or Admiral Picard. But then how did you know about Shaw? Like at the time, I recall thinking Vatic was an AI, that she had instantaneous access to all of Starfleet's records, because that would have made sense the only way she would have been able to to know everything about everyone. But here, she's like completely ignorant. She doesn't know anything. She's like, we have to look up. I want to look up we, everything there is to know about Jean-Luc Picard. Well, I thought you already did your homework. I thought you'd already know. Family, he has no family. That's the most famous thing about him. You know, if you did even a cursory look into Admiral Picard, you would see, except for Jack Crusher, which is new to him, he literally had no family. All of his family burned up in a fire in the chateau. So why is she so, to be, to use a, a poor word choice, why is she so fucking stupid right now? I mean, they're going through every colleague, past and present, every friend to whom he might turn, every loved one to which he might seek comfort. He has no loved ones. And Vatican is saying, we're going to scorch the earth under which he stands, and the night will brighten with the ashes of the Federation, and from them we will rise. So, like a phoenix? I, I, I don't get it. I don't get why the shapeshifters... It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and we got the Star Trek Picard logo. Part 6, the bounty in quotes. And I, I, I knew, and, and spoiler alert, yes, it is tied to the Klingon bird of prey from Star Trek 4. But, um, well, well, we'll get there. So we've got the Titan. It's very, very close to the a, a sun, a star. It's, it's hiding, clearly. And we, we get to Beverly and Picard in sick bay. And Beverly is saying that Jack has been having visions and nightmare, waking nightmares. And once, once he confided in her, she did a, a brain scan. And it is just Beverly and Jean-Luc in a sick bay. I think there's one person way, way in the back. Uh, so th they're quiet. They're they're talking, and Beverly and I realized as soon as she said this, I was like, "Oh no! Don't tell me." He's got eremotic syndrome because Picard had eremotic syndrome, and it's genetic. And now Beverly did a brain scan on her son, and sure enough, and that's exactly what she says. Bullshit! You're expecting me to believe that Dr. Crusher, a doctor who gave birth to a son from a man she knows has eremotic syndrome, that he makes it to 23 years old and never once did Dr. Crusher think to brain scan her own son for the genetic abnormality that killed his father? In what world, in what world are we supposed to believe Dr. Crusher didn't brain scan her son while he was in her belly? I'm sure she could have done it. But certainly once he was born and say, Jesus, maybe I should look if he has eremotic syndrome like his father, like the disease that killed his father. For whatever reason, Jack Crusher's got eremotic syndrome, and unlike in Picard, where it waited till he was at least in his, I don't know, 70s to, to make an appearance, uh, apparently he's got it bad. He's got it in his, well, not only does he have it in his 20s, but he had it even as a child, and she didn't, she remembers the, the, the nightmares that he was having as a kid. And even then, it didn't, she apparently, she didn't do a brain scan, even when a child. I, I don't understand. 
you're in a post scarcity scarce scarcity society you can do all the medical exams you want for free why doesn't everybody have a brain scan you know when they're born and later when they become an adult just to see just like oh maybe there's something we should treat you know we don't know if we don't brain scan you we don't know you could have an aneurysm ready to go we can easily treat that in the year 2500 but if we don't scan you you'll never know it doesn't make any fucking sense so literally flashing on the screen is terminal diagnosis and Picard's like are you sure are you sure yeah I, I she's pretty sure she's pretty sure Jean-Luc she's showing you his private medical records I mean you're his father but I mean and she's his mother but I mean they are also kind of I don't know it seems seems a little bit uh going through privacy records seems a little uh poor choice to be discussing his diagnosis without him present oh so beverly gave him some medication that's supposed to stop the hallucinations but uh it might be decades now before it catches up with him she's like listen don't blame yourself you can unburden him so then we cut to jack who is in 10 forward again in the holodeck and he's drinking heavily and jack says he's celebrating and picard's like you're celebrating and jack's like yeah it turns out he's not crazy he's just broken so he can either wallow in self-pity or be like japanese teacups that are fixed with gold i have no idea what he's talking about anyway Picard is like you be serious he's like I am serious what he tells the I assume it's a holographic bartender to leave the bottle and so he asks how did you how did you beat this and Picard's like I didn't beat it and Jack's like oh that's right I forgot you're a positronic and Picard's like, he, he lived with it for decades. He's like, you'll be fine. You're going to grow old. Crusher, Jack Crusher is like, if only you were as good as passing on wisdom as you were at passing on genetics or passing on genetics as you are passing on wisdom, meaning you're, you're shitty at passing on wisdom. So Jack is saying the irony is he might have been doomed before he was even born and he decides to walk out of the uh, bar for some reason and luckily at the same time to prevent him staying awkwardly at the bar seven calls picard and says they're here and picard gets up and he meets he meets warfy warfy oh my god warfy Warfy, I can't believe I even said that. I, I, I can just picture it now. The new, the new adventures of Warfy, Warf and Rafi, get get in a transporter accident and get combined like two Vicks, but nobody nobody does it because they have to respect the new person that Warfy has become, and we get Star Trek. Warfy, the adventures of the single entity that used to be Rafi and Warf, and they now go around, I don't know, fighting crime and taking drugs. Oh my god. I I, I would hope even Terry Metalis. Even Terry Metalis wouldn't be that cruel. Please, please don't do that to us, Terry. So they beam in permission to come aboard, and Picard gives permission. And like, what again? Who is in control of the ship? 
because last I heard, Captain Shaw is still the captain. Admiral Picard still has no official Starfleet rank because he's retired. And and Riker gave command back to Shaw. So the highest ranking person here is really seven. And so, but she's the one who should be giving permission to come aboard. But Picard, remember in, in last episode, Picard gave Beverly permission to to do an autopsy when he had no rank, no authority to do so. So once again, he has no authority to welcome somebody aboard, but he does. I mean, I'm not going to complain, but officially you would think somebody, somebody on the ship should be like, who's this old guy giving orders? He's not, he's not, he's not on the payroll anymore. So for some reason, Worf knew to the day, to the day he last saw Admiral Picard, he says, far too long. Eleven years, five months, and four days. Minus infrequent messages and the occasional bottle of sour mead. And Picard's like, sour mead? And Riker's like, you mean he means the bottle of Chateau Picard. And Riker says, yeah, it's, it's quite tart. Picard's never been so insulted in his life. And Beverly walks up and hugs Worf. And Riker's like, you know he's not a hugger. She's like, I know. It's just so good to see him. Rafi is now going on. Hey, Jean-Luc. And she doesn't call him JL. Thank goodness she doesn't call him JL. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for that, at least. And he's like, so, so Robbie's like, hey, Jean-Luc, you'd never guess who was taking up meditation. And uh, uh, Riker's taken aback. He's more surprised. Worf is like, yeah, it's better for my battle strategy if I meditate. And then we get the, uh, the uh, awkward reunion of Seven and Rafi who used to be lesbian lovers. Don't forget, they used to be lesbian lovers. They don't let us forget it. Uh, Warp is like, we've got to do this for Ro Laren. We have to make sure she didn't die in vain, not for Starfleet or her kin. So I guess Ro was a mother or is a mother, uh, which that was nice, I guess, but we had no hint she was a mom. So... Riker and Rafi are briefing the, I guess, senior crew of the Titan, which can, you know, is is Admiral Picard, Doctor Crusher, uh, Will Riker, Seven, and Captain Shaw. Why there are no other Titan crew members? I mean, I know they're on a skeleton staff, but you could at least throw in one or two Titan crew members just. You know, give us some idea. Like, I mean, the F ensign uh, was it ensign, ensign LaForge. She, she, you know, she's kind of a big character in this episode. She should at least have some hint of what's going on. But no, it's just them. So Rafi and Worf are briefing them on what's led up to these events, and you know, they do a fair, they do a fair job of saying that during the Dominion War. Uh, both sides acted less than honorably, uh, especially Starfleet uh, giving this virus to all the founders. And, uh, and Picard's like, yeah, but we did give them the cure too. And Shaw's like, yeah, but in doing so, he also created a bunch of uh, fundamentalists or, you know, I, you could understand. You could maybe understand that, listen, even though in Deep Space Nine we were clearly led to believe that the cure was given to the Great Link and in the end no real harm came from it, but maybe, in fact, some changelings did get sick. Maybe some changelings did die. Maybe some changelings are scarred for life. Maybe they were never able to change 
as good as they used to change despite the cure, which doesn't fit in and clearly was not the intent of the Deep Space Nine writers. Because if anybody was to have been injured by that virus, it would have been Odo and the female shapeshifter, as they were the ones who had to hold their shapes the longest. And we were told that's what made the virus, uh, you know, the, the more you changed shape, the more you held solid form, the worse the virus was. So the planet where everybody was in liquid form all the time, you would think they shouldn't have had it so bad. But whatever, I, I can understand it, okay? I can cut some slack and understand that, okay, maybe we have a viable reason why these shapeshifters are more angry than the rest. It doesn't really go with the whole mentality that they are all members of the Great Link. And like in the early days, you know, the shapeshifters would tell Odo, he's like, how many of, of them, how many of our kind are there? And she's like, you don't get it. She's like, you know, there's one. There's the Great Link. And Odo's like, I see. So the many become the one and the one become the many. We never got a real answer as to how many shapeshifters actually exist in the Great Link. But um, apparently enough did that some got butthurt and uh, super, super angry. Yeah, so a few zealots is what uh, Shaw says. Uh, Rafi says, well, whatever they're planning, it's tied to Frontier Day. Picard says, yeah, that's no better place, no better place to do it. And the Warp says, we got to return to the beginning. And this is Daystrom Station. We're told it's the home to most off-the-book secret alien tech. And Daystrom Station, reminder, has nothing to do with the Daystrom Institute, which is where Dr. Gerardi worked in season one, where they generally make robots. Why they are calling this Daystrom Station, I have no idea. It should be called Memberberry Station because it's just a place to load up the member berries and we're gonna get there in a minute. So you would think that the place that they just described as having the most uh, classified, deadliest, most alien technology in all of Starfleet would be like secured by a battalion of starships or the most elite, you know, troops that Starfleet has, something. You, you would expect some sort of presence, some sort of, uh, uh, of protection. And instead, Worf says, no, it's, it's, it's unmanned. It is, it's mostly vacant, unmanned, and Starfleet only, only checks on it like once an hour or so. It's on a patrol route. It doesn't even have a single starship stationed for protection. They couldn't even bring out a goddamn uh, extra, whatever those are called, O-Birth science vessel. They couldn't even find an extra O-Birth to just sit there and give like somebody, you just watch and if anybody comes here, Make a make a call to Starfleet, and we'll send in the big boys. No, but they can't spare a single ship to protect the most advanced facility in the entire quadrant. Probably, no doubt, no no surprise. Things are stolen from there apparently all the time. So uh, they're going to go and they're going to break in because they have the key. And Worf says. A few months ago, a few months ago, Vatic stole a handful of classified materials, including, including the portal weapon. So you, you know she's got more than the portal weapon. Well, what else did she steal? Do you think that maybe you should tell us at this point? And Dr. Crusher says, ah, you steal the pearls. To, you steal the, the diamond 
to no, so nobody notices the pearls are gone. Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, that's like you break in and you steal a nuclear bomb and you steal uh, Abraham Lincoln's sword. And like, ah, somebody's using Abraham Lincoln's sword to, to stab people. We're going to forget the fact that they stole a nuclear bomb. It makes no sense. So seven is saying the only way to identify and retrieve this missing weapon is to go there because all of Rose files were redacted. Rafi says the raw data is in the computer core. And Picard says, so we have to break into the very institution that's hunting us. Very, very lucky that it's not, it's not occupied, but it is an astonishing lethal AI system, one that thinks and adapts, but they've got the key. But if the key fails, they're all going to die. Picard is saying, Roe believed this was central to the investigation. This is the only way they can clear our names and fix Starfleet. Like, who do you clear your names to if all of Starfleet's already taken over? Like, what if all the admirals are already dead? I don't know. So they warp in behind a conveniently placed moon. And uh, Seven, and they go into a transporter room to beam down. And Worf is saying, I've been in battle with countless lovers. With lovers countless times, it can be okay. And Seven assures them, don't worry, I'm not going down. And Worf is like, oh, thank God. So it's it's William Riker is the third member of this away team. So Seven says, we have to get you in and out before the manual uh, safety patrol, which comes in an hour. So Riker's got the key for some reason. He's like, otherwise we'll need some good old-fashioned Klingon offense. And Worf is saying he prefers pacifism to actual combat. Yeah, and that's from the trailer. Riker says we're all going to die. Of course, his Klingon pacifism includes beheadings on Wednesdays. So now Worf has the key. This very pleasant AI welcomes them on board. She's like, please identify yourself. Now Worf starts pulling things out of the wall. An alarm starts going off. She's like, identify yourself immediately or lethal security precautions will come online. So they he sticks he sticks a key into the circuit breaker on the wall. And all of a sudden the AI goes through like a dozen different voices and becomes very friendly. And I could have swore one of those voices was Data, Data's voice. Anyway, they turn off the security system, uh, but all of a sudden, two or three Federation starships warp in right above Daystrom Station. Now, the Titan is still on the other side of the moon, so these ships with their fancy sensors, I guess, can't detect the Titan. But the Titan can detect them. And they know. They're like, they found us. Shore's like, how did they find us? We dropped the transponder. We didn't trip the alarm. So Shore calls for a red alert. Beam our people out. But they can't get a lock on their transport signals because those ships that beamed in all have transport inhibitors on. Starfleet vessels are, are locking on. And LaForge the daughter, is that those are Epsilon or Echelon, whatever starships with pinpoint whatevers. If we get even hit by even one, they'll be able to track us forever. Of course they will. One hit, if it doesn't kill us, they'll be able to retract their residual ionic energy. Picard says, Picard says, uh, we got to get out of here. And LaForge says, short of being invisible, 
we can't come back. Short of being invisible, we can't come back. And that gave Picard a good idea. He said, I'll be back, I promise. They're going to be back here in an hour. So uh, Captain Shaw says, get us out of here. Maximum warp. And just microseconds before getting shot by the other Starfleet ships, they warp away. And now Riker and Rafi and Worf are on their own. Now understand, they have one hour to warp somewhere, do whatever they got to do, and come back. But we stay with Worf and Rafi and uh, Riker. And Rafi is like, what exactly are they storing here? Rafi, you were just in the briefing. You were just in the briefing. In fact, you were giving the briefing. And Worf is like many of Section 31's most secret technologies. And Riker like Section 31. And Worf explains. And he's like, I know what Section 31 is. And there's these member berries on the walls about what uh, technology they're walking past. The very first one, I'll be honest, I don't remember it. I'm sure it's something, but I can't quite see, read what it is. Uh, but the second thing we see is the Genesis device. The Genesis device from Star Trek II. Of course, the, obviously the original Genesis device was detonated. So this is called actually the Genesis 2 device. So obviously Section 31 or somebody rebuilt the Genesis device and they've just got it waiting there to be used again one day. And we get a real clear picture of the Genesis 2 device, which for some reason powers on when Riker walks in front of it. Then we got Worf walking past uh, something and Rafi looks at it and it is, it appears to be the remains, the remains of Captain James T. Kirk. Yes, I assume somebody went to the Genesis planet and retrieved the body of Captain James T. Kirk. And it now sits in the Daystrom uh, station with Section 31. So maybe Section 31 is trying to find a way to recreate Captain Kirk. Happy birthday, William Shatner, by the way. It was yesterday. And now you see they plan to bring you back somehow some way they're not going to let you go james t kirk and then wharf walks by a window and he looks in it for some reason even though he knows this isn't what they're stealing he knows they're on a they have a short amount of time but he has to check and it's a tribble it's a tribble and it it's for some reason, this the window slash screen, like the screen is also a window, and the the what's on the screen goes away. And you saw this cute little tribble on the screen. And then, of course, as soon as it goes away, it says genetically modified tribble. This most disgusting, evil looking creature jumps onto the glass. It's got five mouths with uh, sharp teeth and this like fucking spider legs. And it's a thing that would give you nightmares. You can't watch this with kids. I mean, this thing is as scary as those fucking ear things were in Star Trek Two, And like it jumps, would be jumped right onto Worf's face. Clearly lethal. I mean, I don't understand. Are these what all triples do? I mean, certainly it looks like an eating machine, but we'd, or is this just genetically modified to do this? I don't know. Uh, Captain Riker calls it an attack tribble, and he, he jokes at Worf 
for taking a step back when it did this. But every everybody, anybody would have jumped back at this. It was completely unexpected, and it's it's gross and disgusting. Uh, Breaker himself would have jumped back. Nobody would have believed this to, to be real. So Worf says, I see you still like jokes. You still find comfort in humor. And humor in other people's discomfort. Uh, Will says, you used to poke back. What happened to you? Rafi's got to come in and calm them all down. Let's just retrieve the manifest. We got to figure out what was stolen and get the hell out of here. It's a good thing we have a woman with us, else our testosterone would have stopped us from doing our job. So now we have the AI. Uh, we see the AI is, is looking at their faces and as they, like in a camera, and it, it brings up their personnel file. And we see that it recognized Will, uh, even and brings up his uh, his picture uh, more from Star Trek Nemesis, what he looked like younger, and his uh, William Riker uh, Starfleet personnel file, and it's got all place of birth, Alaska Earth, like it doesn't have the city in Alaska, it just says Alaska, because I guess they don't know the city. And his full name, date of birth, marital status, married to Deanna Troy, education, Starfleet Academy. Uh, anyway, uh, his parents, uh, all, all, but anyway, so the system recognizes him and it's generating a security response. So, Rafi says we're looking for some type of access panel to the mainframe computer. And a crow flies. A crow flies over Rafi. And it lands in front of him. It's a holographic crow. We can see it's a hologram. And Riker's like, what's that? A holographic crow. And Worf says, let's continue our search. We have to tread lightly. We need to be friendly energy. Riker says he doesn't understand the world anymore. And another security alarm is activated. Riker is saying there's something familiar about that crow. And Worf believes he's at the mainframe now. And he touches something and it makes a sound. And Rafi's like, what is that? And it's F sharp. It's a good thing Will is there. He's a musician. Every time Worf touches something, we get an audio cue, and then the screen goes black, and we hear a voice, and he says, I think, therefore I am, and we get Professor Moriarty from the trailer, and his hat is on, and he's, he, his head lifts up, and Riker's like, Professor Moriarty? And he says, greetings, old friend. And he pulls out a gun. He pulls out an old pistol, an old-timey pistol. And he says, greeting, old friends. And he holds them hostage. So then we go back to the Titan. And they have arrived to the Fleet Museum. And we see the old space dock. And Picard says, every legendary starship, this is their final resting place. Now, they didn't say they were going to the Fleet Museum. They were going to Anir Prime or something. I, I forget the name, but uh, so this is like, oh, I've been here. This is where every legendary starship is. And we get a, a, a beautiful picture of the old space dock. Apparently, the what we thought was space dock uh, is actually a completely new space dock. I thought they had just added on more sections to the original space dock, but no. Apparently, they moved the original space dock to this other planet and made it a museum. And what they added to it 
were these circles, like pods, where all these famous starships uh, just, I don't know, hang out in space. And in this very first glimpse of it, we get, I can see, uh, I can see, clearly see, I mean, my eyes go right to the Klingon bird of prey, uh, a uh, what appears to be the Enterprise A. Um, I see a Romulan bird of prey. Uh, the problem is that their their sizes are all way off. Like all of these ships all just happen to be the size to fit inside these circles when we know some of these ships are much bigger than others. But whatever, it's it's actually a, a pretty nice picture. Um, and obviously this is gonna be another Memberberry station. She says, Helm, find a pocket among the relics. So Ensign LaForge is saying, Respectfully, sir, I don't think we should. It's not a good idea. They're being hailed. And who's doing the hailing? It is a very pissed off Geordie LaForge. And Picard goes, Geordie. He says, listen very carefully. Power down all your ships, non-essential systems immediately. And Picard's like, but Geordie, we need your help. And Jordy and his other daughter beam on board, which I don't understand why they would beam on board the uh, Titan, but they do. And Seven says Commodore LaForge. And Jordy says, for the millisecond his body was being reconstructed, he debated the, whether he should do a curt professional handshake or a long overdue hug. And Beverly came up first and he hugs Beverly. Him and Beverly hug. She looks at him in the eyes and he goes, Admiral. And he says, Sydney, because that's his daughter. And Jack didn't know. Jack didn't know that Sydney was his daughter. No, he, he's like, oh, very surprised. And Picard's like, allow me to introduce, and he's pointing to his son. And, and, uh, LaForge, uh, Commodore LaForge, he's a Commodore now, uh, is saying, Jean Luc, I'm, I'm too busy to, to be introduced. I'm in the memo, I'm in the middle of my third memo to Starfleet objecting to gathering the entire fleet in one location for Frontier Day. Not to mention the thousands of people that pass by daily. Somebody's going to realize that your ship doesn't belong. And it's like, we need to find a place to talk now. Then Jordy's other daughter, who beamed over with him, says, hey, sis to Sydney LaForge and you can tell they have a thing going where she says sorry and says he's impossible and then the other daughter's like I'll find a way to to talk to him and Jack now looks at Sydney LaForge and we get we start to get the like uh oh is there a budding romance coming and it's like Jack Jack and Sydney LaForge or at least Jack seems interested in Sydney for the first time. And Jack is like, so we both have father issues, I see. Jack says, oh, that was warm and cuddly. And Sydney is saying that he, she, her and her father haven't been on the best of terms. And he's like, oh, maybe, maybe we could, uh, no, he doesn't say it, but you know what he's thinking. So now Jordy is saying, that young man is your son? Uh, and Picard's like, yeah. And he's like, you old devil. Leave it up to you to turn fatherhood into an intergalactic incident. 
he said it's there's changelings going on and she's like Worf and Riker and Jody's like you brought them into this too they're all they're all he's like listen I had to bring everybody into this you want my help to break them out of the most classified facility in the entire Federation well yeah Jordy apparently it's 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 there's it's unmanned and there's only a, an hourly uh an hourly checkup by a, a random ship on a security easily predictable security uh route so Picard's like if you could just clone our transponder signal we can make them think you gone somewhere else. LaForge says even if he was willing, he can't do it because he would need multiple ships. But even if he could do it, he tells his his daughter to tell him. He says, despite my father's severe objections, every ship in the fleet now automatically talks to each other. They're all networked. So Starfleet networked all their ships. So even without even without a tracking device, they're still all trackable. So so all that BS about what the other daughter said about hitting it with ionic res uh ionic energy and be able to track it. They didn't need that. It was always traceable. And when Shaw was wondering how were they always being found? Well, if there were Starfleet ships, apparently they all talked to each other anyway. That's how they were being found. The fleet is fully integrated. You can drop transponder, transponder signals all you want, but it's only a matter of time before one gets close enough to your ship to find it. It's like those Apple Air Tags. Those are scary as shit, by the way. Those Apple Air Tags, they find you. If you get close to an Apple iPhone, you're you're fucked. Anyway, we're back at Daystrom Station, and Moriarty still has his old time pistol aimed at them. And Rafi's like, "Can somebody tell me why a 19th century hollow villain is guarding the Federation's most sensitive, uh, you know?" Uh, stuff and he's like I'm just not a regular hologram my dear villain doesn't do me justice it only reveals your simplicity Worf has his Worf has his sword raised to Moriarty's gun Moriarty then shoots his gun which blows out the fucking window behind him so this super secret super AI system that is Moriarty has bad aim and furthermore apparently doesn't give a shit about who knows what is behind the glass in that other you know thank god it wasn't some virus that he just released that kills everybody he, god knows what he shot up but it was probably something unimportant like some other some other captain's body he shoots two or three times. And then Rafi shoots him. And Worf shoots him too. But he's a hologram. And it goes right through him. So instead they decide to run. Because like, of course you can run from a hologram. That can appear anywhere he wants. On the station. So. Riker says that he's not the Moriarty that they appeared on the Enterprise. Maybe he's some sort of projection. It's exactly the Moriarty that appeared on the Enterprise. He was a hologram. Anyway, music notes start playing. D flats and some other, some other letters. Moriarty is giving a speech. Time has spun you all apart. Your pathetic old warriors. The whole station is shaking uh, at this music. And Ryan goes like, that's C sharp. A flat. Are you trying to play a song? Some sort of tune? 
And he's like, yes, it's a maddening melody. One that he cannot get out of his head. And then we hear dun da dun da dun da dun. And it's and we Riker is remembering the day he met Data in the holodeck, way back in the encounter at Farpoint. And we get we get the TNG, original TNG footage of Riker meeting Data and Data trying to whistle. And Riker whistled back, and Moriarty said, marvelous, and disappeared. And Worf is like, how did you know it would work? And he said, it's a tune I had, uh, a tune I, I used decades ago with somebody who dreamed of crows and somebody with the intellect of Moriarty and who dreamed of crows. And now they go into the central vault. And guess who's in the central vault? It's Data. It's Data. Data's alive. Again. Again. Oh my God, he's so fucking old. He's so old. It is hysterical. It is hysterical. I, I am like literally laughing my ass off. I'm not supposed to be laughing, but I am laughing. They have Brent Spiner back again. Oh my God. He's just, he's just fucking standing there. He's not moving yet. Just seeing his fucking so old and I'm sorry, his fat face, his old and fat face trying to play data. Oh my God. It looks like they didn't even try. They didn't even try to make him look young again. They were like, fuck it. We, we ran out of money. So we got another shot now of the Fleet Museum. And we get to see, uh, I believe it's the, is it possibly the NX-01? Uh, we got a constitution, a original constitution, no bloody A, B, C, or D. Pre, yeah, not not the Enterprise because that ship doesn't exist, but something else. Um, we get uh, we got the appears to be the Stargazer, uh, the original Picard Stargazer. Uh, we see the Titan. The Titan is sitting in one of the what was an empty uh, circle previously. Now the Titan is is hanging out there, literally hoping no one notices them. And again, we get a great picture. Oh, not really a great picture. It's way in the distance, but it's clearly a Klingon bird of prey. Uh, and we clearly have the Enterprise A. And Romulan bird of prey. So, even though this is old space dock, they do have the new lighting, meaning it's dark. Oh, no, they're on the Titan. Never mind. Uh, maybe that's why they're not taking. That's, okay, of course. Of course. Now I know why they beamed over. Why why Geordi would beam to the Titan and not, and not Picard go to space dock. Because they didn't have money for new sets. They, uh, of course, I mean, honestly, it, it makes sense now. Why why make a set for space dock when we can just use the set we already paid for for the Titan? So that's why all this discussion happens on the Titan. Okay. Uh, so uh, Jordy is saying, listen, I can't help you. I would be, you know, I'd be court-martialed, best case. Worst case, they'll come after my family. And frankly, you know, I love you. But I'm not putting my family at risk for, for you anymore. That part of my life is over. His daughter is like, what about Hangar Bay 12? And he's like, shut up. She's he, Picard is like, this is life or death. He's like, it's always life or death. He's like, back in the day, I chose to put my life on the line. But you've knowingly put my daughter in grave danger. Picard said, I did nothing of the kind. So anyway, the other daughter, 
walks out of the room and says she's so sorry about this. You know how stubborn he can be. And she walks away. And Jack and Sydney, who were hanging out right outside the door, uh, who, by the way, Jack is on the bridge now. And he's wearing a shirt that he's got. He's got a, a comm badge on it. So Jack sits in the captain's chair. And Seven says, off. And now Seven is showing ships on the view screen to test Jack. And we got the Defiant. We get a we get a great picture of the Defiant. He's like, that's the Defiant. So he knew the Defiant. And then we get a picture of uh, an original, an original uh, Constitution class with the gold, uh, with the gold dish, like it was in in the original series. Of course, it's not the Enterprise. It's the New Jersey. It is the USS New Jersey, which uh, shout out to um, Star Trek nitpickers, which uses the USS New Jersey in his fan made uh, fan made films, uh, the Adventures of the USS New Jersey. There it is. There it is. And he knew it. I, honestly. I'm very surprised he knew the New Jersey. Although I guess he could read. So I guess the fact that he could read, it says it. So then Seven clicks on another one. And he says, oh, wow. This is his personal favorite. Uh, as is it everyone's personal favorite. So many. And okay. Okay, Terry. I get you. I'm going to cut you some slack for this one episode, for this line. We got a beautiful shot of the NCC-1701A, Kirk's Enterprise from the movie. Uh, probably was originally the Yorktown or whatever. It got remade. We saw it. We saw it for the first time at the end of Star Trek IV. And then they used it in Star Trek V and again in Star Trek VI. And then we never knew what happened to it. And here it is at the Fleet Museum. And Jack Crusher says, you know what? Uh, this was his favorite. Kirk's, Kirk's Enterprise. Perfectly clean retro lines. He's definitely a Constitution man, he says. And Seven says, you're really good at star at uh, starship history for somebody who doesn't give a damn about Starfleet. He said, oh, he, he cared about starships well before he knew anything about his old man. And then Seven brings up the Voyager, USS Voyager. And Jack doesn't know which one that is. And so Seven's got to tell him. USS Voyager, she made her name further out than any of those other relics had ever been. She was reborn there. She was her home. Now, to be fair, I believe it to be true, or at least it can be true, that Voyager was further out than any of the starships we've seen so far. But the original NCC, no bloody A, B, C, or D Enterprise, was certainly out further than Voyager. Uh, it had left our galaxy and, and, you know, in some TOS episodes. And the Enterprise D had been to the very edge of the fucking universe. When the Traveler, you know, infused his essence into the warp engines and they, they went galaxies by galaxies to the very edge of the universe and back again. But the Enterprise D is not at the museum because Counselor Troy crashed it. Well, well, half of it blew up and Counselor Troy 
crash the uh, the saucer section. So we don't see, I thought maybe we'd see the saucer section floating. I don't see it anywhere. And they don't show it to us. So maybe what Seven is true, Voyager did go further than any of these relics. But there are certainly starships out there that have been further than the Delta Quadrant. Anyway, she says the crew were her family. And now she's just, and she stops herself and Jack is like, you're just trying to find another. She says, we're all just a little bit alone, aren't we? All stars in the same galaxy, but light years between us. And Seven says, oh, you're definitely your father's son. He has a knack for poetic drive-by observation. It's very annoying, but it can also make a person feel safe. It says, being equal parts, irritating and endearing isn't all that unfamiliar. And there it is. There's a Klingon bird of prey. He's like, is that a Klingon bird of prey? She's like, yes, the HMS Bounty. They pulled it. They pulled it from the uh, from the bottom of San Francisco Bay. And um, Jack is like, I heard about that. The whale thing. The whale thing. Seven said it was really hard to find. It disappeared. And Jack is like, right. And we get a really nice close-up view. Oh my God, this is a beautiful view of the underbelly of, of the bird of prey that is the reason for this channel's name. This ship, this ship is why Bird O' Prey 5 exists today. This is the ship that decloaked in front of the whaling vessel and the the harpoon hit against its hull this ship oh my god i have so many emotions so many emotions ah oh. but then jack crusher says they couldn't find it because the cloaking device reactivated so the cloaking device which needs a ton of power, reactivated when it was underwater? I mean, okay, I guess. I mean, it makes no sense. Fine, but they needed to get us to remember, oh, if only they could disappear. If only they could disappear. Oh, here's a ship that can disappear. And for a small moment, a small moment, I was like, oh my God. Don't tell me they changed to the Klingon bird of prey and finished the season in that bird of prey because they can cloak. I was like, oh my God. I was like, just the cost of the sets, there is no way they can afford to do that. And then, of course, I was, I was right. Spoiler, they don't steal the ship. But they will end up stealing the cloaking device. And that's when Jack Crusher realizes he just needs the cloaking device. So now we're back on Daystrom Station and everybody is hanging out in front of Data and Riker's like, he wasn't trying to hurt us. He was trying to get through to us. He's reaching out to us. And Ravi's like, I thought Data died twice. And Riker's like, he did. And uh, Worf is like, this is not our Data. And Ravi says, no, this has biological and synthetic parts. And Riker's like, it could be part our Data. Data copied everything he was into B4. And B4's head also happens to be there. His personality, 
his mind. Up to now, it's been unrecoverable. But since the ban on synths has been lifted, nothing's impossible. It looks like after uh, Dr. Soon died, uh, the other Soon from, from season one of Picard, that uh, Starfleet took all of his work. So why did that guy die? Did, did he even die in season one? I thought he was going to live for a while. I don't know. They took a keen uh, interest. And she's like, what's that? And we get a hologram of Dr. Soon, Aaron Soon, before he gifted Picard his golem. His intention was to live beyond his years, to become his own legacy. And now he sees in his final days, it wasn't part poor humanity, it was poor science. And we get a nice shot of a Klingon D7 and a bird of prey again. And the he's given a speech about evolution isn't just preservation. And you see the ships evolving as they go through it. And we see Geordi talking to Picard about his daughters. We always want to impart the best aspects of ourselves into our children. Picard says, we're not in control of what we pass on, including flaws. And the sins of our past, blah, blah, blah. So, Aaron Soong is saying, into this new golem will go a bit of lol, a bit of lore, a bit of before, and a great deal of data. But this time with the wisdom and, yeah, wisdom. But why would you make a new, why would you make a new golem that's as old as fuck? If you were making a, a new golem that was going to be around for a long time, why did you make him as old as you? So Jordy is talking with Picard about all the times they rushed into danger on the Enterprise. He never feared for his life, but he can't help Picard and protect his children. So he's sorry. He really is but he can't help. So Picard says they're leaving. He goes on to the bridge. We got to respect his wishes. And uh, Sydney comes into to, uh, the room to talk to uh, Jordy, her father, and says, why didn't you help? And Jordy says, we came to an agreement. You're going to stay here. And, uh, so are they on? I don't know. I, I thought they were on the Titan, but now maybe they are on the, the star base and they're just using the Titan set. But, uh, the daughter is saying she grew up listening to Jordy's stories. Jordy saying it was a different time. The daughter's like, no, it's you and I are different. I'm not an engineer like you. You built amazing things. I just wanted to fly them, she's saying. And you took it as me rejecting you. But she always said it brought us closer together. She never tells her that you were a pilot first. And she's like, she obviously rejects everything he's saying. Jordy's tearing up. He's like, you're on the run, jeopardizing your future and your life. She's like, you're on the run with, I'm on the run with my crew. And Jordy's like, but they're not your family. She's like, yes, they are. You taught me that. And I'm not scared to step up like you are. So Jordy had to be told off by his daughter. He had to be explained to his daughter how to be a man again. So Picard is saying their only choice is going to be to go in fighting so seven says battle stations so jack crusher is now talking to both of the uh geordie's daughters 
and they realize that there's something else, a better option than, uh, uh, they have a better option than to go to battle stations. So Jack and the two sisters are, are working on this new plan. And Jack has clearly got a thing for Sydney. And the other sister says, let's reset our phasers here. You know, Jack's like, what's your temperament for minor larceny? So the two daughters are happy with it. And we know they're going to go steal the cloaking device. So now we're back on the station. And Riker is trying to explain why Data is alive again. And so Worf comes up with Data is not protecting the manifest. He is the manifest. So he said Data should be able to tell exactly what the changeling stole from the Institute or whatever the station. And now they've run out of time because a bunch of Federation Starfleets, apparently Starfleet officers are ready to come. Security officers are ready to come bake, breaking down the door. So they're, they're trying to get a hold of, of Captain Picard, but Captain Picard's not there. So we get a real moment here from Captain Shaw. Because Captain Shaw, Captain Shaw was an engineer. He's like, sir, and he's, he's like, Geordie. So Picard and Riker meant nothing to Captain Shaw. But Geordie, the engineer, that's the man he actually idled. And Captain Shaw is trying to express to Geordie what an honor it is for Geordie to be on his ship. And it's actually, it's, it's a touching moment as as an engineer myself, I can understand where he's coming from. Um, and Jordy is like, listen, your ship is, is being held together by 21st century duct tape. Now, why he would have to reference it as 21st century duct tape, I don't know. I would think, uh, he would think if anything, it would be 20th century since that's when it was invented. And, you know, going back to the original NASA missions where duct tape was actually, you know, used to save lives on Apollo 13 and whatnot, and probably all the time in the space shuttle. Uh, it, it just seems like a 20th century invention. But anyway, regardless, uh, Jordy says, listen, if it was any other time and you guys weren't about to all, you know, be killed and ruin my family, I would love to sit here and geek out with you. And like Shore is just so happy to get that. Been a weird week. You can gladly geek out with them. The marvel of maintenance and engineering that this ship is. And that that's enough for Captain Shore to be happy. And this is bridge to transport. See that the LaForges get home safe. Who's your transport officer? She he was killed. He was killed, and now the whole ship goes wanky, and they're reading a massive EM spike. And Jordy says, "What the hell have you done, jo uh, Admiral?" And Jordy says, "You stole the goddamn cloaking device from my bird of prey." Jo and he have to say, he says, "Picard says, Jordy, I would never steal from you. I promise." And they realize it was Jack. Jack stole the cloaking device. So Jack and the two LaForge sisters are trying to put the uh, put the clear cloaking device on board the Titan. Uh, again, confirming that there were no other engineers on the Titan. So majority said removing the cloaking device tripped an alarm. And it's like that automatically notified Starfleet that you were here. And it's like, your daughter, it's like, now your daughter needs you. So the cloaking device is starting to spark. And the ship cloaked, but it decloaked. It's overheating. And Geordi's daughter doesn't know how to stop the overheating. But Geordi says, 
I do, he steps on. And Jordy says to Jack, you stay away from my daughter. And and Sydney is like, Dad. So now Sydney is interested in Jack too. And uh, Jordy tells Jordy tells his other daughter to let their mom know they're not going to be home for dinner. So now, for whatever reason, even though they're still clearly at wherever the fleet museum is, their comms are working, and the, the comm badge can reach the Titan, and Picard is like, we'll be there momentarily. Uh, so... Luckily, I guess they're all close enough in the galaxy that it takes less than, I don't know, five minutes to warp over. And um, Riker's like, we're going to take Data with us. Says, so pulling him offline will disable security. Phaser, Starfleet will come in. Phaser's blasting. But Riker, oh, so first, so Riker, uh, Riker asked Picard, what do you, what do you got? What are you doing? And Worf, uh, uh, correctly guesses. I'm guessing they're coming with superior Klingon technology. I, it's a joke line. I get it. But it's really not a line Worf would ever utter. I don't think Worf believes for a second Klingon technology is superior. But whatever. Uh, that's, a, that's a nitpick more than anything. Um, so yeah, Data, uh, this old, old, ugly, fat Data is just standing there. And they're like, yeah, he's coming with us. You know? So Riker says, tell the Titan to lock onto an extra set of coordinates. They'll just beam Data away. Okay, so now the Titan beamed in uh, the Titan warped in, uncloaked. As soon as it warps in, it immediately cloaks. But it already showed up. So those ships there should know it's there. Now, I know what happened. They're like, well, how do we know that? How do we show the Titan showed up if, if, it's, if it's cloaked? They, they realize they don't know how to do that. So instead of having the Titan, you know, warp in already cloaked, which it should be able to do, ships went to warp while cloaked all the time. You didn't have to uncloak to, to warp or, or to exit warp. But there's no way of showing that it happened. So they needed to, to cloak immediately. Yet the, that should have given away the fact that they arrived. So they have arrived, they've cloaked, and somehow nobody knows they're there yet. And then Seven says, if I'm correct, we'll have to decloak to beam them up. No, no, you shouldn't have to decloak to beam them up. Never in the history of track have you had to decloak to beam people up. Even that actual cloaking device, which was used in Star Trek for the voyage home, that specific cloaking device, you absolutely could be cloaked and use the transporter. We saw it happen like a dozen times during the goddamn movie that the, the, the bird of prey was cloaked. The, the scene where the, the whale lady comes yelling, Admiral, Admiral Kirk, she, she bumps her head into the goddamn ship because it's cloaked and Kirk her, her himself beams her on board. You can totally beam while cloaked, but for some reason, Seven thinks you can't, so of course they're going to uncloak. They could have been so easy to just transport them away while cloaked, but now they've got four to beam up, and they've got incoming Starfleet. Uh, I thought they were already there, but apparently they were at a hallway, and now they're finally making their way to where they should have been, where they should have beamed into in the first place. And Rafi says they're coming. So Riker takes a phaser and he's like, I'm going to get our friend out of here. He's got this. 
So Riker alone goes and he starts shooting at the, uh, I assume they're shapeshifters because it appears like his phaser are set to kill, but who knows? He's shooting at the, at the Starfleet security. And now we're on the Titan and there, and the, this is the, 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 the apex of the action of this episode. The Titan is doing evasive maneuvers. They're, they're like right over the Daystrom station. They're like they have to be right up on the away team to beam them over for some reason. Uh, Riker gets hit. He gets shot from behind. And of course, he gets shot with a, there's a physical, I it's like a physical thing stuck in his back. It wasn't just a phaser. And so uh, Seven says we lost a transport inhibitor. He gets shot with a transport inhibitor. So he's like, beam over whoever we've got. So Jordy and Jordy and Worf see each other for the first time as Jordy was at the transporter room. Jordy comes out and like, Worf, Jordy. So uh, they're like, Where, where's Riker? And Ravi said he got captured. He says, we may have lost one friend, but we've gained another. And then behind Worf is Data. And Geordi sees Data. The first Geordi's like, doesn't know. He's like, Data? Data? It's like, this goes beyond all logic. How is Data here? So the Titan is now at Worf. And uh, Worf tells Picard he will he will find him admiral i will bring william riker home and you know fearful be the man or god or beast that get in my way and picard says he believes him and they shake hands and he says thank you now is worf leaving the series at this point i mean he leaves the room but is that goodbye from Worf? I, I don't know. Like, where is he going? They're at Worf. They're not, he's certainly not getting off the ship at the moment. So Jack Crusher sees his father is alone and takes the opportunity to come in to talk, I guess. He's sorry about Riker, he says. Jack says, he can be a lot of things, mostly the prick at the bar who says things that can't take back. Maybe he's a bit cocky. However, he thinks he's got some virtues as well. He's caring, he's tenacious, principled, he hopes. And sometimes clever. He says all those things he gets from his mother. But he can also be brave and wiser than he has any right to be. And until a week ago, he didn't know where those came from. So he says, maybe you didn't just give me some bullshit disease. Maybe you gave me some good things as well. Ah, Picard says, maybe. What a moment. So now Jordy and his daughters are saying, I'm not mad for what you did. I'm disappointed for not doing what a younger me would have done and needing you to remind me. He's very proud of you. And he, okay, so now he asks for a specific tool and, and Sydney says, no, you don't need that tool. You need this other tool. And Jordy's like, hey, you're right. And she's like, why do you think I smashed so many speeders when I was a kid? It's because I wanted to work with you. And that would make sense if they were working on the ship. But Jordy was working on data. How could Sydney have any idea what tool he needed for data? And Picard says he's watched data die twice. And, and uh, Jordy's like, that was old data. This is new data. Uh, and 
Beverly says it's an almost human positronic body. So Jordy says the information's all there. If he's sane enough to speak, and Worf is back, so I don't know what that handshake goodbye was. Worf is still there. So he can reboot, but he doesn't know what personality we're going to get. And so as long as he's sane enough to speak, he should be able to tell us whatever we need to know. And so Picard gives him the okay, and Jordy unplugs the wire from this mostly human body. Oh, he doesn't unplug it. He just touches it. And it turns data on and data. Oh my God, this terrible face. And data is looking around and he's like, Jordy? In data's voice. And Jordy's smiling. And then data, and it's not really data. Data's head turns again and he's very confused. He's like, Captain? And he's like, and Picard says, Yes. Data, is that you? He says, yes, sir. Then, no, sir. He's confused. He's not certain what's going on. Beverly says, he's like you, Jean-Luc. He's like synthetic, but human, says Jordy. Uh, Data says, there's many of me inside Daystrom Institute Android M510, but one voice speaks louder than the others. So Picard's like, on the evening of the robbery, something else was stolen. Something more deadly than the portal weapon. We believe you witnessed the event. Can you confirm? He said, can you confirm? Dwarf is asking if he can, if he's malfunctioning. And he's like, previous... Previous records indicate what appears to be the changeling main objective. This is the missing item. Can you tell us what was stolen? Jean-Luc Picard. He's like, yes, I'm here. Can you tell us what was stolen? And again, Data says, Jean-Luc Picard. Jean-Luc Picard. Jean-Luc Picard. And they, Worf thinks they need to use a reset switch. And I've already, obviously, everybody's figured out what they stole. And now Laura comes on. And now, and now B4 takes control. And now Soong takes control. And they said, no, I'm more. Lore. More? Anyway. But God's like, it's vital you took us what was taken from the lab. And now his eyes... His eyes become a projector to project to project a hologram, and we see what they took. They took Picard's dead body. So somebody went to the planet with the synth people and dug up the body of Captain Picard and brought it to the Institute. I guess they put it next to the body of Captain Kirk, and the changelings went, and the changelings stole. The dead body. The changeling stole the dead body of Captain Picard. What the fuck did they need the dead body of Captain Picard for? So now we see Riker being interrogated by Starfleet personnel. They're beating him in the face. And he holds a phaser to Riker's head. And... Then the guy turns around and kills the two, the two other uh, security officials that were with him. And you're like, oh my God, is this guy really a friend? Was he, what, what was going on? What's his deal? And then his, he, his shape shifts. And you're like, oh my God, for this, for this brief instant, you're like, could it be? I mean, we know Odo, René Aboujanois, is dead. But was this Odo the whole time? Was he a friend? And no. It's Vatic. Vatic, and she's laughing. She's laughing hysterically. And she says, hi. 
And like, we're all like, what the fuck is going on? Why did Vatic just kill her own people? And now those Starfleet ships that were right above uh, uh, Daystrom Station, they're gone and the Shrike is there. So the Shrike came at some point, presumably destroyed the other Federation ships or not, I don't know. And now Vatic has Riker on her ship. Vatic has Riker on her ship. And Riker is being pushed uh, in her ship. And Riker is like, how much of that goo shit did they pour into you? He's looking at one of the bird people. The bird people slaps Riker. And Riker says, you really think after 30 plus years of loyalty, you think I'm going to betray loyalty, my loyalty for you? And Vadik says, no, Captain Riker, not for me. And we know what's coming next. Riker looks, and it's, it's Deanna. It's Deanna. Vadik kidnapped Deanna Troy. And Deanna Troy says, oh, Will. And she's shaking her head. And she sees Will's beaten body. And Deanna says, oh, Will. End of episode. And Will, I know what you're thinking. But let me just say, no one will blame you if you let Deanna die. No one will blame you if you let Deanna die. If you go to Vatic and say, Ha ha, bitch. Joke's on you. I hate my wife and I always have. Oh, man. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen. But if it did, that would, that would be an immediate plus five. Plus five. Uh, so that was the end of the episode. And I'm... Uh, I'll be honest, I'm in a, uh, I'm in a place I didn't think I was going to be. This episode wasn't awful. Oh, it's got some awful conveniences, some really awful plot points. Why is, why is the most secret, uh, base in the Federation with its biggest, most important, uh, technological alien tech? and secrets, and, and diseases, and, and God knows what. Why does it have zero security? And it does have zero security besides a, an AI. Uh, ridiculous. Uh, why are the bodies, why are the bodies of the most famous captains in Starfleet stored in, in a, in a starbase? Instead of you don't know, interned in a in a in a a cemetery somewhere on Earth, right? Don't you think Captain Kirk would have preferred to be if if his body wasn't shot into a star like it should have been? Uh, that if it was going to be put in a cemetery someplace, that he would prefer it to be on Earth or Captain Picard body why did they they leave it there for somebody to find why not why not have it put somewhere buried in chateau picard uh it, why do they have to you know decloak the ship to beam people up when we've seen that exact cloaking device not have to decloak before but on the other hand, man, to see some of those old ships again, the Defiant, the Defiant, the Enterprise A, uh, original series Constitution class, Voyager, and the damn HMS Bounty, the Klingon Bird of Prey, that started it all for me. All of them in the same episode. I mean, the ridiculousness 
of the Genesis 2 device. And oh my God, an attack tribble. An attack tribble. An attack tribble. It's so ridiculous. Those are all bad. But oh my God, the beautiful Enterprise A, the beautiful Defiant, the beautiful HMS Bounty, Klingon Bird of Prey. This wasn't an awful episode. It was ridiculous. It was ridiculous, but it wasn't awful. I, I honestly going to give this episode an eight. An eight. Now, it, unfortunately, it's a, probably a lone eight. But if, if this is episode six, if seven, eight, nine, and ten come back to this, you know, there might be a saving the series. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to get too happy too fast because when I have expectations, that's when they, that's when they get lost. But having little expectations for this episode, it helped. It helped. Uh, I, I don't see how they can possibly pull out all the stops like they did this episode. It, it just wouldn't make any sense. And I still, you know, what's more ridiculous now is Vatic. Like, what are there, two different, two completely different shapeshifters, cliques fighting? Like, it's not that there's one breakoff group of shapeshifters. There seem to be the shapeshifters which took over the Federation and the shapeshifters that are with Vatic. And they seem to be, have different, different priorities. Like, which... So we have two different groups of renegade shapeshifters. That's the only thing that makes sense. It doesn't make sense because if they were working together, this would already be over. This would have already been over. Anyway. So yeah, a surprise. Eight out of ten for this episode. And uh, we'll see you again next week. Kapla all. Bird. Out.